Good evening. Let's make a, a start. Before we get started, um, I wish to acknowledge that the um, university is situated on Nunga land and that Nunga people remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs, and knowledge. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2023 My Carol Traveling Fellowship Award evening. I would like to especially acknowledge Mrs. Helen Carroll, her daughter, Marie Louise Carroll, and granddaughter, Coco Divola. <laughs> this is the first introduction of the second uh, generation, so you're welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to see the room filled with uh, fellowship supporters, uh, sponsors, colleagues, and friends. We have some apologies, uh, uh, Dr. David Chattel, who actively participate in the selection committee, is not able to make it tonight, uh, this evening. And also, Dr. Bill Collins um, sent an apology. He rang me while I was on holiday uh, in India, and then I said, Bill, after, after a long talk, I said, Bill, do you realize that uh, this will cost me money because I was on a roaming? Oh, I should, you should have told me. I said, don't worry, I have a lot of time for you. So he has got a cataract surgery, nothing serious, but he said he will definitely miss uh, this event. I would also like to acknowledge the following guest today, our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Senior Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Tim Colmer, is supposed to be here, but he's not here today, so I'll send him an email if he doesn't come. He's accepted. <laughs> Uh, and also our uh, IOA, in Institute of Agriculture, Industry Advisory Board Chair, Terry Enright, I know, he's in town. He's also supposed to come. Uh, Professor, um, Emeritus Professor David Lindsay, uh, and a number of other colleagues uh, are here, so I won't name, but uh, certainly we value your participation and support for this fellowship. The Mike Carroll Traveling Fellowship at UWA is a memorial to the late Dr. Mike Carroll in recognition of his devotion to agriculture and for the tireless and selfless efforts to improve the lot of farmers, wider agricultural community, and scientific colleagues, particularly the young generation. Now you can see the history. Uh, this is now a special year for us, 20 years since the fellowship officially began. It started, um, I, I hope, uh, I think people like David Lindsay may remember, uh, Tim, we're just going to send an email, what are you doing? <laughs> well, welcome, Tim. Um, uh, it started at the press court room, the first one, with a few members, and uh, of course, uh, Professor Robson was there. So I had the pleasure in joining all the 20 um, fellowships awards. We'll hear about that more. The UW Institute has developed a video exploring the history, significant impact of this fellowship, or impacts of this fellowship, which features in interviews with the past and present students, as you, as you will see shortly, this fellowship has made a meaningful and long-lasting impact on each recipient. That was the intent. Their travels and experiences not only enhanced their postgraduate research journey, but also played an important role in helping them to get to where they are today. It's my pleasure to premiere this video to you this evening. Now what should I do? <laughs> <laughs> I will leave all that there. I'm going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mike Carroll Travelling Fellowship. 20 years, 27 fellows, immeasurable impact. The Mike Carroll Travelling Fellowship is a memorial to former Director General of the WA Department of Agriculture, the late Dr Mike Carroll, in recognition of his efforts to improve the WA agricultural, farming and scientific communities. The fellowship also reflects the great value Dr Carroll placed on international relationships. It supports travel related to the recipient's postgraduate research at the University of Western Australia, enhancing their knowledge and expertise. To 
date, 27 students have benefited from the fellowship since the first recipients were awarded in 2003. In addition to developing valuable interstate and international linkages, the fellowship has greatly enriched their student experience. The first fellows in 2003 were Tom Biddulf and Martin Villa Ayub. Dr. Biddulf attended the 10th International Symposium of Pre-Harvest Sprouting in Cereals in the UK. Dr. Villa Ayub traveled to South Africa to attend the International Weed Science Congress in Durban. Hello, my name is Martin Villa Ayub. I was awarded my Carroll Fellowship back in 2003, which I think it was the original year of the award. At the time, I was doing my PhD at the School of Agriculture and Environment under the supervision of Professor Steve Pouts and Dr. Paul Neve. Um, with the award, I was able to participate, participate in the fourth uh, Wheat Science Congress, which was held in South Africa, and it really uh, gave me the opportunity to develop my professional career. Now, uh, now I'm back in Argentina, based at the National Research Council as a senior scientist, and I take this opportunity to thank Mike Carroll uh, and all his family, which I met on several occasions back in those days. Thank you. The 2004 recipient Graham Dool worked closely with Professor Larry Carp at the University of California to resolve agricultural and resource problems. In 2005, Christopher Jones flew to New North America to assist his investigation of oil production in Sandalwood to benefit WA farmers. In 2007, Shane Friesen attended the annual pesticide resistance conference at Rothamsted Research Station in the UK. Later that year, Di Mabry attended the International Symposium on the Nutrition of Herbivores in China, followed by the 12th seminar on sheep and goat nutrition in Greece. Also in 2007, Megan Chadwick worked with Professor Fred Provenza in the USA to better adapt sheep to eating a high salt diet from Saltbush. Meanwhile, Wei Hua Chen carried out specialized experiments on the transport of phosphate in plants at the University of Adelaide. In 2008, Annalise Mason traveled to France to research the development of a new super brassica oilseed crop species. Parvinda Kaur attended the 2008 International Conference on Plant Pathology in India. Kaya and hello. This is Parvinda Kaur and I have been a very proud recipient of the My Carrot Fellowship in 2009. I specifically remember the year because that was also the year I got married and it's been exactly 13 years of celebrating that relationship. Having said that, this fellowship did not just give me an, uh, an opportunity to go back to my alma mater, which is Punjab Agricultural University, to look at few other races of the same fungus that I was doing my PhD on, uh, specifically looking at the disease load that it presents to a main canola crop, which is Indian mustard or Brassica gentia, we call it in scientific terms. It also provided me an opportunity to connect in that particular space to all the experts in that side of the world. And that has actually really helped my career going forward because I have been really, I've had a keen interest in understanding evolution. And when you call evolution, evolution is not a phenomenon that happens in one part of the world in you know one little sector. It is connected, the whole ecosystem is connected, and the more global you can go to connect the dots, the better impact your science makes. So I'm extremely grateful to the Carroll family to provide me that opportunity and to create such pathways for many researchers in their PhD degrees. Thank you so much. In 2010, Lalith Surya Goda visited Professor Norbert Klassen's Plant Nutrition Laboratory at the University of Göttingen in Germany. In 2011, Chelsea Fancote attended the 62nd annual meeting of the European Association for Animal Production in Norway. She and Cece Lee also presented at the 8th International Symposium on the Nutrition of Herbivores in Wales. Anandini Ganesalingam was the 2012 fellow. 
She furthered her research into mixed model analysis of plant breeding trials at Rothamsted in the UK. In 2013, Yongjuan Guan collaborated with the University of Alberta in Canada to learn about microRNA techniques. She then attended the 11th World Conference on Animal Production in China. In 2014, Joe Steer expanded on his fly research at Rothamsted in the UK. The following year, Anna Amir visited Turret Field in South Australia to research new multi-purpose forages. Mary Ann Lowe then presented at the 2017 EGU General Assembly in Vienna and Technical University of Munich. Candy Taylor presented at the International Conference on Legume Genetics and Genomics in Hungary, trained at Kew Botanic Gardens in the UK, and visited Palaki University in the Czech Republic. Hi, my name is Candy Taylor. I'm originally from Hungary in Western Australia, and I'm currently working at CSIRO in Floriot as a postdoctoral researcher. I was a recipient of the 2017 Mike Carroll Travelling Fellowship, which enabled me to undertake a six week trip to Europe during which time I attended my first international conference and visited two research lab groups working on latent genetics and genomics. The experience was one of the fondest I have of my PhD and enabled me to grow my confidence, not only in terms of being able to present to my peers and colleagues, but also in terms of enabling me to grow confidence that I was on the right pathway and pursuing a career that was really exciting and rewarding. My sincere thanks goes to the Carroll family for enabling me to take that trip. In 2018, Fang Ning Zhang conducted research at Justice Liebing University in Germany. Yue Ji Chang learned the pioneering technique of single chromosomal isolation in canola while in the Czech Republic. Suyog Subedi overcame challenges of the pandemic to work under Associate Professor Andrew Williams at the Department of Parasitology and Aquatic Pathobiology in Copenhagen. Sude Tiernaz travelled to Japan to visit Dr. Ryo Fujimoto's lab in Kobe University and Dr. Shohei Takuno's research group at Sokendai. Tonight, you will hear from current Mike Crowell Travelling Fellowship recipients, Michael Young, Mukesh Chowdhury, and William Thomas. But first, a special message from Junre Amas, who is currently completing his internship in Germany. Hi, everyone. I am Junre Amas. I originally came from the Philippines, and I'm currently finishing up my PhD studies here at UWA. So I was awarded with the Mike Crowell Travelling Fellowship in 2021 which allowed me to conduct a short research internship at INRA, which is the main agriculture institute in France. So at INRA, I was able to learn the techniques for screening plant life resistance in canola and also obtain additional data for my research project. So the Mike Carroll's Traveling Fellowship not only allowed me to learn technical skills, but also it enriched my PhD journey by working with other people within a different lab setting and it also allowed me to expand my research network, which I hope will also increase my uh, research opportunities after my PhD. The generosity and tireless dedication from Mike Carroll Travelling Fellowship Committee members and valued donors enables this award to grow and flourish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana, and also Rosanna, to put together that um, video. It's a great effort. We will put the, um, the voice so you won't be on the YouTube all the time. And uh, I was told that uh, your voice is not good, so they selected uh, Diana to give the voice. So, <laughs> so that's what uh, the directors have to follow your colleagues, what they say. Thank you again. Uh, now, um, let me correct. No? No. All right. Um, thank you very much. We will be uploading this video to our YouTube channel shortly so that all members of the public can learn about the appreciate the value of my Carroll Traveling Fellowship over the past two decades. And the other thing is that we are getting contribution from some of you again. So the Big Quest Fund is uh, active uh, and we will never touch the capital money. The interest generated uh, comes back and we have got that and then Helen Dave Chatel and myself look at that and then we 
look at the applicants and we can give up to two. Sometimes I look, uh, we could give up to three depending upon the decision. So uh, contributions through universities, uh, because fund, which is going to be pretty good and uh, you will all agree, no doubt, that this has been quite a valuable exercise. Many of those students, I think almost all of them, produced one or two papers as part of their PhD because they were able to go to those research institutions. Otherwise, they would not have been able to go and that extended. And the other thing is that many of them are now leading uh, in their areas uh, in Australia. Um, uh, for example, Ben is uh, now the chief scientist uh, of uh, Ben Bidup is the chief scientist of uh, DePerd. So I'm sure that all this training, not only scientifically enriched, but also for their career as you move on. Now, I had to, now it's my pleasure to welcome Mrs. Uh, Helen Carroll to introduce our first student presenter. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be very brief, Sadiq. Before I start with the um, presentation that I'm to do, I've just got two very brief notes on behalf of the Carroll family, and I'd like to acknowledge um, Mick Poole's death last year. Um, now, along as we know, as long with David and with Bill Collins, and Professor um, Lynn Neve were responsible for establishing the Mike Carroll Fellowship and grateful thanks to Mick and you will be missed Mick. Okay and the second thing I'd like to share with you is Sadiq's awards. Every time I see him he's got more awards. Okay so I'll be quick. There's industry, industry recognition and the hacker professor Karambot Sadiq from the Australian 2022 Research Magazine, the top researcher in botany, right? Yes. And Clarivale, I have to confess ignorance that I don't understand Clarivale, where it is, but a highly cited researcher in agricultural science, plant and animal sciences. It is Sadiq again. Okay, so now, can you hear me at the back? Yes. Okay, great. I will be brief. Um, now, you would like me louder? Okay. Okay. No, there's nothing more boring than sitting in a group and you can't hear what the per you can't hear what the person is saying. That is much better. Um, now, our first um, presenter this evening is Michael Young. Now he is from Kojanup. He is currently three years into his PhD in Agricultural Economics at the University of Western Australia. Michael has spent his postgraduate studies developing a new farm analysis tool to optimize farm management in the face of increased climate variability. For his fellowship, Michael travelled to New Zealand to learn and experience farming outside of WA. Thank you, Michael. Where's Michael? <laughs> it's over to you. Okay. I remember meeting you several, quite a few years ago. Yeah. I was younger and so... <laughs> All right. So I was, I was now step aside. I'll leave that there. Right. Good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to present about my trip to New Zealand. I'm very thankful for all of you who's put, put together and made this uh, award possible. It was a great opportunity that took me to the South Island of New Zealand, where I spent just under a month doing a, a touring a range of different farms and just experiencing agriculture outside of, outside of Western Australia. So obviously the trip was associated with my PhD, which has been about, well, the core of the PhD is about improving farmer decision-making 
and as mentioned before, I'm, I've sort of built uh, a farm optimization program to help to help sort of achieve this because as many of you know, farming systems are pretty complicated, particularly when you include sort of multiple crop options, multiple livestock options, um, different soil types, price variation, climate variation, etc. So yeah, built a model to help capture all those intricacies of the, the farm system and it allows you to then evaluate you know, different economic questions that sort of focus around optimising your management to you know, maximise your profit and ensure your sustainability. So as you can see in the photos, we've got Phil, Phil Verko and Ross Kingwell are my supervisors. Um, just being very good. <laughs> Mostly, one of the man's. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why did I go to New Zealand? So the bulk of my work has been Western Australian based, or particularly in the Great Southern, just because I'm from Kojanap, I've sort of focused my work um, yeah, around that sort of region, just a bit biased. Um, and yeah, so even within Western Australia, farm systems change significantly and I haven't done I haven't been to New Zealand before. I've done very little farm exposure outside of Western Australia. So I was really interested to sort of see if the methodology that I'm applying would be applicable elsewhere, but also really interested to see if there's things that are being done outside of Western Australia that I should actually be including in, in my sort of methodologies and um, that sort of thing. And I decided to go to New Zealand when originally, as you saw on the a slide a while ago, I was actually planning to go to the US, but that sort of got a bit muddled up, so I ended up going to New Zealand um, because I thought of thinking that it's not super different to Australia, meaning that sort of ideas are probably transferable, but it's still different enough that they're, they're doing different things that we're not doing here. So that gets you sort of thinking, you know, what, what, what should we be doing that they're doing or vice versa. And agriculture is one of New Zealand's, if not New Zealand's biggest industry, so they put a lot of work into doing it really well. So I thought, yeah, if you're gonna learn anything, New Zealand's probably a, quite a good place to do it. So now I'll just give you a bit of a rundown and just a few, just a few photos of the trip and sort of what I did. So one of the first farms I went to was a, a large dairy farm. Um, I hadn't really been to a dairy farm ever, even in Australia before. A lot of the work I do is um, very much sheep, sheep related, so it was really cool to sort of, you know, get on, the, get on the ground and actually see how it works. Like this is, the farmer was showing us about the, you know, the milking process and all the requirements they've got to go through as far as keeping the milk sterilised and, you know, certain temperatures and all the sort of book work they do, etc. And that other lady there happened to be, she's another PhD student, in New Zealand, she happened to be touring at a similar time to me, so we just happened to cross paths at this property, which was interesting to see. Um, so in New Zealand, the winter time is it's obviously particularly cold, particularly wet, nothing grows. So they tend to, they tend to plant a, a crop, a fodder crop over the summer where it's a bit warmer, and they'll then keep it until winter and they'll graze it in winter. So every morning I'd have to go out, um, that little wire, it's, a, it's an electric fence basically, um, called the brake, so you move the brake forward a couple of metres each day and give the, give the cows or cattle or whatever a, a bit of fresh paddock. So, I mean, it seems easy except for that it was about negative 10 degrees, so it was a bit, <laughs> a bit miserable, but still good. Um, they often do silage, I mean, yeah, silage, which is sort of, in the summertime, they'll cut excess feed and they'll pack it into these big bunkers that are stored, they sort of dig into the side of the hill um, and then feed it out again in that sort of winter period. So that was really interesting and it got me thinking like we don't really do that much silage in Western Australia, yet all, their, all the farmers there are saying it's really, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a lifesaver. I mean, it used to be a little bit common in Western Australia, but it's died off. So that's, that's something that's on the radar to you know, potentially analyse down the track. They also have a lot of irrigation set up, which is a bit different to at least what, what I'm used to in uh, 
Western Australian farming. And an interesting little thing is, so this pivot is, is much longer than a paddock, and the paddocks are all fenced. So the pivot's actually got to cross over multiple paddocks to complete its circle. Um, so they have these little bars at the front of it that allow it to run over the fences, and the fences are, I don't know, elastic enough that they just run over and then spring back up again. So that was kind of interesting. Um, spent a bit of time with this guy that I've forgotten his name doing some pregnancy scanning. I mean, pregnancy scanning is it's a common practice over here in Western Australia, just scanning your sheep to see what their pregnancy status is so you can then manage them according to you know, how many fetus they have. So that was interesting to see how they do it over there. And obviously you can see sort of, this is an extreme photo about the sort of the climate they're working with, snow on the hill, um, ridiculous the minute. The photo doesn't necessarily do it justice, but that is awfully steep. All the farms have got sort of, well not all, most of them have got some sort of stream or river running through it. So the environmental challenges as far as ensuring they're not polluting the water, they've got to manage their fertiliser applications, their sort of livestock, um, you know, waste runoff, etc. So they're a bit further ahead than Australia as far as their sort of <coughs> environmental policy, but it was really interesting to see where we're probably likely to, to head towards in the, in the coming years and just seeing how they're handling it and how the farmers have, you know, they don't like it, but the farmers have obviously got on board with it and uh, are doing a really good job. It's just some more animals that I saw when we're over there. Nothing too special. Except old Billy. Billy thinks he's a duck, so he would, he would, hang, he would hang around the ducks all day um, at the duck pond. So that was, that was pretty funny. And so the sort of main take home from the trip, it was really just an eye-opening trip as far as I haven't, yeah, I haven't said before, haven't really been outside of WA, haven't seen dairy farms before, haven't seen cattle. So it was great to just get a new perspective on farming get a few new ideas, things that I can incorporate into my work now and down the track to hopefully, you know, continue to improve the industry and bring out some new ideas. Um, great to get some international exposure, particularly in the farming area when you're trying to, to publish, publishing in international journals, etc. Really useful to have that link to how, how they're thinking outside of your little bubble. Um, we met some great people and obviously had a lot of fun. So that was yeah, an amazing trip. And as far as the future goes, three years into the PhD in about a week. So I'm hoping to, I'm just sort of writing it up and finalising a few um, analysis bits. So yeah, finishing up in the next couple of, couple of months and then yeah, focus my time towards my farm analysis business, which is sort of a continuing on from this PhD. So I'm using the same tools to um, answer different questions that are facing the industry now and in the, in the future. So I mean, as, as an example, recently I did a bit of work with Deep Herd um, looking at how a drying climate is going to affect farmer profitability but also their sort of management, how, how they can manage to deal with a, deal with a drying climate. So I think it's quite, quite important work. Um, so yeah, looking forward to getting into that a bit more. And, yeah, thanks everyone for coming along tonight and making this trip possible. listening to you and didn't get things ready. All right, now our next, um, the next speaker will be Mr. Mukesh Chowdhury. Mukesh Chowdhury. Um, he, Mukesh is a scientist from the ICAR Indian Institute, oh, sorry, I forgot, Indian Institute 
of May's research in India. He has six years' experience breeding maize and is currently in the fourth year of his PhD of Western Australia. Um, Mukesh's research is on heat stress tolerance in wheat. Tonight he will be presenting on how he used his Mike Carroll Travelling Fellowship to visit the Plant Breeding Institute, Narrabi, and the University of New England in New South Wales. Thank you, Mukesh. Come join me. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> Where is the presentation? Thanks, Helen, for such a nice introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Mukesh, as already introduced, and I'm in the fourth year of my PhD, and uh, hope to finish in the next six months. And uh, uh, I'm working under uh, the uh, uh, supervision of uh, Professor Wallace Colling, Professor Gujunyan, and Professor Kadambot Siddiq. And uh, I would like to Thank uh, for this uh, Mike Carroll Traveling Fellowship that provided me an opportunity to uh, visit three places, University of New England, Armidale, Plant Bidding Institute, Narabrai, and Kobiti at uh, University of Sydney. And uh, now let's start with my presentation. So first of all, coming to my research, uh, as we all know, climate change is a serious concern uh, all over the world since last few decades and it results in unprecedented rise in temperatures. And that rise in temperature exposes wheat to heat stress at the critical stages that ultimately results in the severe yield losses. And as we all know that wheat is a major crop in Australia and globally, and it is a, an important issue to work on the heat stress tolerance so that sustainable yields can be maintained. So my research aim is uh, focused on the identification of heat stress tolerant germplas and study the genetics and mechanism of heat stress tolerance at meiosis stage. Meiosis, that is the stage through which the gametes are formed. And it is a very sensitive stage to heat stress, but it is the least explored stage for heat stress tolerance. So coming to the first place of my trip, I visited University of New England uh, to attend a course uh, genetic Evolution and Breeding Program Design, and it is taught by a, an eminent professor, uh, Julius Wendorf, we can see in the picture, sorry. Uh, he's uh, the expert, and he has over 30 years of uh, animal breeding experience and works on, especially on the quantitative genetics and the genomic analysis prospects. And uh, it was an excellent course that uh, I have been able to learn many things through that like genomic data analysis and breeding program design. And I'm going to use the uh, lessons from this course in analyzing my PhD research data. It will be immensely helpful in that. Then uh, there is a new, or I can say an uh, innovative breeding approach, optimum contribution selection, that uh, my supervisor, Professor Wallace, also works on. And it is based on maximi maximizing the genetic gains with the minimum inbreeding depression that helps in maintaining the genetic diversity. That is, germplasm has a good diversity in a longer run, so that we will have higher genetic gains or higher yields in our breeding programs. And it also helped in making some future collaborations and networking. And uh, I'm happy to say that I have been able to pass this course with a distinction. Yes. <laughs> Uh, at the uh, same place, I was uh, able to attend a crop breeding symposium that was on current research in plant breeding and molecular genetics at UNE and UWA. It was uh, organized with the collaborative efforts of UWA and UNE, thanks to Professor Wallace and Professor Lee from UNE, who were able to conduct such an interactive workshop. Uh, it was the first time that I have seen such an interactive symposium in which 
uh, like in, in every slide, there were a lot of discussions and it was really difficult to move on to the next slides. <laughs> so I was able to present my research findings and received uh, many good feedbacks that I'll be incorporating in my research program. And there was a good learning from the diverse speakers who were working in different crops like chickpea, canola, and it was a good learning uh, from their research programs what they are doing. And it also helped in making some good networks and connections that will be uh, surely helpful in future. Second place that I visited was the uh, Plant Bidding Institute, Narabrai, University of Sydney. At Narabrai, uh, research team under the leadership of Professor Richard Trethoman had a GRDC funded research program on heat stress bedding in wheat. And they are doing an excellent work. They have excellent facilities, like they have large scale uh, breeding field trials, like it's in uh, hundreds of hectares. They have the heat stress breeding trials. And they are using portable heat stress chambers. Like these are the chambers that they can sift on and expose the wheat plants to heat stress during critical stages of the wheat growth cycle. Then they are using drones to capture the phenotypic data. And they have extensive plant growth facilities like control environment rooms, uh, glass houses, and they are uh, also having some advanced uh, physiological equipments to score data like pollen viability analyzer. Uh, last place uh, that I visited was the Plant Bidding Institute, uh, Kobiti, University of Sydney. Here I had a great experience of witnessing an excellent research for the wheat rust screening. And it is an Australian national rust screen facility where they have thousands of rust isolates, and they are doing a wonderful job there. And also, they have a very uh, good uh, double haploid wheat breeding program where they are using maize as a donor for the generation of double haploids in wheat. So coming to the summary of learnings from my, this trip, I had a, uh, a very good learnings from the course that I attended and the symposium, and it will be eventually very helpful for my thesis writing and uh, my data analysis. Uh, it, uh, it has given me a confidence. I was able to clear many doubts with the, the uh, professors and also with the fellow students that attended the course. Then uh, I had very good experiences from the heat stress breeding programs that will surely be helpful in my review of literature as I am working in heat stress breeding. And uh, I made uh, good collaborations. Uh, they have agreed that uh, we can share and they can test our germ plans for under the uh, heat stress field trials. And uh, eventually, it can result uh, out into some good publications in the form of uh, research articles and uh, review articles. And uh, finally, I had a uh, very good uh, networking and connections that may be helpful in grabbing some opportunities, like in terms of job opportunities and other collaborations in future. So other than that, uh, there was uh, man, uh, many other beautiful memories, like the social kind of things that was, uh, I was able to enjoy. Like uh, 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 in the first pictures, two pictures, we can see this, this is a very Creek station. It, it is a small town that is between Armidale and Narabrai. So I had the chance to have one of the best burgers, chicken burger there. <laughs> I enjoyed it. <laughs> and uh, other than uh, uh, there, there were different, like diverse landscapes that I was able to witness other than Western Australia. And uh, I met my friend Amit, uh, with whom I did my master's at IRI uh, during 2012 to 14. So it was a long gap of seven years after that I met him and we had a good discussions. And, had uh, like a flashback of those memories we used to study together. Uh, it was nice to meet Professor Richard Rathuman. He's a renowned wheat breeder and a very good, uh, 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 he's like a gentleman personality and he says everything uh, about the research, what they are doing. Then I met uh, Professor uh, Brian Kinghorn. He has developed the Metzel uh, software. It is a software that helps in the optimum contribution selection for the generation of the optimum mating list that we have to attempt, like the process that we need to attempt to maintain like higher genetic gains with the minimum inbreeding depression. And uh, he is such a nice gentleman that uh, I was so happy to meet him. He has, uh, like uh, Professor Wallace took us uh, to home for a like dinner party. And he has maintained such a big workshop and he's a uh, like a good traveler. And he has a collection of many bikes, motorbikes, and cars. So first time I have seen like a scientist was enjoying that things also. <laughs> uh, 
and I was happy to meet him. So finally, I would like to thank uh, uh, Mike Carroll uh, for the Mike Carroll Traveling Fellowship to the Carroll family, then Institute of Agriculture and UWA for the additional funding, my supervisors, uh, Professor Wallace, Professor Siddiq, and Professor Gujun for their kind support during my PhD and my applications. Uh, Professor Wallace uh, suggested for the uh, course to attend this course that uh, it will be life changing for you. You will learn many things. You will know, uh, no, never get an opportunity. Maybe in, uh, like you will never get an opportunity to learn those things. And I realized that UN is the only place where the animal breeding department is so strong and they are the only trainers for the quantitative genetics to like uh, other peoples and the rest of the world. Many pe uh, people who have passed out from there, they are. Uh, like in the top positions in quantitative genetics all over the world. And uh, uh, thank you, Professor Siddiq, for uh, some extra funding. <laughs> uh, I would like to th thank my hosts, uh, Professor Julius Wenderwerf, uh, Professor Lili and team at UNE, and also Professor Richard Rathuman, Rebecca Thistlewit, and team at University of Sydney. Thank you. Thanks to all. Yeah, it's uh, very complex and difficult. And uh, like, uh, this is the first heat stress breeding program that has initiated in the Western Australia. There, there, there are like there were previously there was no work done, and we have found that uh, the the stage that I'm targeting meiosis, it is just like two weeks before the flowering, before the anthesis, and we have found significant impact of the heat stress in the reduction of the grain yield and grain number, and uh, some of the physiological traits as well. So there is uh, like a significant impact of heat stress, and it's really a complex state. Like in my results, what I have found is that mostly I'm getting like minor QTLs, not much major QTLs. So it's, it's governed by many genes. So it's a complex state. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Mari Louise Carroll and I'm happy to introduce the final speaker for tonight, who is William Thomas. So William is originally from Perth and completed his Bachelor of Science with honours at the University of Western Australia. After working for a year in government, he returned to UWA for his PhD studies and is currently in his third year of research. For his fellowship, William travelled to Canada to undertake research related to identifying new sources of disease resistance in canola. Thank you, William. Thanks very much, uh, Marie, for that introduction, and good evening, everyone. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my um, trip to Canada um, in the middle of last year. So just a bit of background about my research. Um, as Marie said, I study disease resistance in canola. So canola is a really important crop here in WA. It's the, the third largest, and um, WA is the biggest canola producing state uh, in Australia. But unfortunately, there are a number of diseases that um, severely impact um, the yield of canola. And the biggest culprit um, is a disease called blackleg. So blackleg disease is a type of fungus um, and you can see in the bottom right here, it um, grows inside the plant, um, and when it's bad enough, it will just basically kill off the entire plant. So every year, um, we see around 25% yield loss um, due to blackleg disease. So it's a really, um, you know, that translates to um, quite large economic losses. There are a number of ways we manage blackleg disease. Um, so you can use fungicides or rotate crops and fields. But by far, the best method and the most cost effective is to use disease resistance genes. So uh, when a plant has these resistance genes, it can recognize the fungus um, and it's protected from the disease. 
So it has um, complete resistance. So I just thought I'd give a little bit of context about how this trip came about. So I was working on one of my experiments, which is one of my um, chapters in my thesis, and that was to identify one of these resistance genes. Um, it's quite a long-winded process. Um, so to start off, what I was doing in the glass houses here at UWA was hand pollinating different canola varieties to um, produce um, seeds with really specific genetic um, kind of backgrounds. So you can see on the right there is a bit of an overview of how you develop the seed pods. So that was going really well, but then we ran into a bit of a problem. We realized that we didn't have the, um, the genetically compatible strains of the fungus that would interact with the plants that I was working with. Um, so this was a bit of a problem and it would kind of stop me progressing with this experiment. So what I did was contact um, Professor Delantha Fernando, who is based at the University of Manitoba over in Canada. Um, and Professor Fernando is a collaborator of my supervisor um, and he's an expert in blackleg. So he's, he and his research group study the, f the fungus, whereas we study more the plant side of things. So uh, very fortunately, I was awarded the Mike Carroll um, Traveling Fellowship in 2021, uh, which enabled me to arrange um, to go over for a few months. Um, so that was in June uh, last year. So I packed my bags and went over to Winnipeg, which is the capital city of the province of Manitoba. So you can see um, in that map of Canada up in the left there that uh, Manitoba is quite a central province, um, very, very flat. It's one of the prairie provinces. So they grow lots of canola over there. So I went to Winnipeg, which is the capital city. Um, so there's a photo of downtown Winnipeg um, to the left there. And then this is one of the central buildings um, at the University of Manitoba. They have a really huge, uh, big, big, beautiful campus over there. And then this is Professor Fernando. So luckily, um, I was able to settle pretty quickly um, in my new apartment and pretty much launch straight into lab work over at the university. Um, and the main objective of mine was to um, grow, grow and work with the fungus. So this was um, a, something I haven't done before. So it was a new skill, um, something I, they're experts in. So I really wanted to um, pick that up and bring it back over here. So how this process works is basically you grow plates um, of jelly. So it's actually made from tomato and carrot juice. Um, so it's those orange plates over there. So the fungus really loves this, um, this, this juice and it's able to take the nutrients and grow. So as you can see, I grew a number of different strains um, and over time the spores will um, grow on the plate and eventually take over the whole plate. And what, what I was waiting for is for these black spores to actually produce this um, kind of, oops, sorry, this uh, disgusting looking pink um, ooze or pus. So this is um, what we use to actually infect the plants. So it's what we use to um, kind of progress the experiment. So this is a picture of the, uh, under the microscope of this um, yeah, substance. So the next step was to infect my canola seedlings. So while I give you a quick uh, overview, you can actually watch me in action um, going. So but basically the process is growing up um, the seeds, which I brought, brought from over um, in Australia. And you punch a hole in the leaves, um, and then using that pipette there, you drop some of that pink uh, fungus onto the wound. And then this um, goes into the plant and infects it. And basically from then, the plant will either be resistant or susceptible. I wish I could work that fast uh, in real life, but... <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was uh, really happy with the results I was able to get over there. Um, so you can see on the left there, I, I found some plants that were resistant. So I know these plants have the gene that I'm looking for. Um, and you can see that the fungus has infected, but it's not really spread or caused much damage. Um, versus the susceptible plants, which I know they don't have the gene that I'm looking for. Um, so that means the fungus is able to grow freely and spread and cause a lot more damage. So what I'm able to do is extract DNA from both these resistant and susceptible plants and then do a bit of a genetic analysis um, and compare those and that will hope, um, let me narrow down on the gene that's actually responsible for this resistance. So I began that process over in Canada by extracting DNA from all those plants. So it was about 200 samples. So it took me quite a while to extract all the DNA um, and I packed it up in boxes, uh, put it in my backpack and actually carried it on the plane back here to UWA. The customs officers had quite a few questions when I arrived at the Australian border with uh, 200 tubes of colourless liquid, but I had all my documents so I was, I was able to get through. 
So in terms of some of the outcomes of the trip, um, obviously working with the fungus was a really great skill that I, I wanted to learn over there. Also, I was able to chat and um, talk about my research to a lot of the other students and researchers um, at the university, um, some of whom I'm still in contact with. Um, and funnily enough, uh, Professor Fernando, who's in the red there, actually came and visited UWA just a few weeks after I got back. Um, so that's him and myself and my supervisor, Professor Batley, um, in our lab. Um, so that was great for him to come and see what we do over here um, and keep show, um, showing, show, show him about the lab. Really importantly, the data that I collected um, will form a really crucial part of one of my thesis chapters, which we're planning to publish uh, jointly with the Canadians uh, once it's ready. So that's really exciting. Um, and also, right before I left, I was able to give a lecture to some Canadian uni students, uh, which was a really cool experience as well. So I met a lot of great people over there, made a lot of uh, new friends. Um, I was able to help a few other, a few other group members um, with their experiments. So in the top left there was um, a field site around one hour outside of Winnipeg, um, where they were growing some canola, but looking at another disease actually. Um, but it was great to, to go out and see the very flat uh, Manitoba. Also, during my uh, downtime when my experiments weren't too busy, I was able to sneak away uh, from Winnipeg and, and visit a few other places in Canada. So I was able to go to Banff, which I'm sure some of you may have heard of. Um, it's a, a, a town in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. So that was just um, absolutely incredible um, to go and see the, the breathtaking scenery over there. And then also on the way back, I was able to stop over at Vancouver um, and explore the city for a few days as well. So uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much to the Carroll family and all the donors and sponsors here tonight um, for such an amazing opportunity. So thank you. Yeah, good question. So no, we actually find that that was part of the reason I went over there because they had very genetically different um, strains of the fungus, which kind of enabled me to work on my experiment. Um, but once you find the resistance gene, that can still be used for all the Australian black leg strains, if that makes sense. But, but usually, yeah, the genetics are quite variable just because of the conditions and everything like that. Yeah. Very yep. <laughs> Great, thank you. No other slides? No, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, um, I think I should go to Canada. I got, I got some money I had to spend before the um, end of the year, so Deputy Vice Chancellor said, said, this is the money which university give for highly cited researchers, so I'm going to go for a trip to Canada. Um, Professor Fernando, I met him in Malaysia, and then shortly after that he came to visit Jackie's lab. So he's very keen on developing some joint program in undergraduate program. So I think we should take that seriously, and, and because there's a lot of uh, similarities, crops, uh, legumes, and, 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 and oil seed crops. So Jackie, we need to talk to him, because he's also the dean of uh, some graduate students and so on. So excellent. Thank you very much, our fellows, for their presentation this evening. I would also like to acknowledge the work put in by the committee members, Helen, Dave Chattel, who is unfortunately could not make this evening, and very interesting uh, time when we meet at the committee, different perspective, and of course I do put a little bit of effort into that. And Cora supported us as the executive officer there. So they spent a considerable amount of time in choosing and people like Helen come in a different view and ask questions, will it help? What is the, no, no, they were all, they are all good. So it helps us. But I also want to thank the supervisors who really encourage the students to put. So we're going to call for the application very soon and we will then select in May, which helps the students. So it's working very well. So we should encourage more students to apply and we can give examples of the best successful applicants for other students to do that. So it's working very well. 
And, and we are getting a strong field of applicants. So we may look at uh, Helen, whether we can give three, um, if there is enough funds, et cetera, because sometimes what happens, the students finish by the time the next round comes. They are mostly into their 50% a part of their thesis. We don't want someone who is going to finish, or we don't want someone very early in their life cycle. I also thank my team members. Uh, so obviously, Rosanna has put a lot of efforts. Uh, Diana here. Cora, and of course my two uh, fellow associate directors, Phil Verko and uh, Wallace Carley. So thank you very much for attending this evening. Your continued support is very much appreciated by the students, committee, sponsors of the fellowship, more importantly, the University of Western Australia. We hope to see you next year. And now it's the fun part. We're going to have some drinks. I haven't had any wine so far, so I'll take some wine and drinks and nibbles. Please join us and then interact with, uh, particularly with the students, but also with the other colleagues from the university here. Thank you.